Well, thank, thanks so much, and thanks for having me. Uh, Matt Schrader, somewhere over here, has been trying to get me to come to Next for the last couple of years, and I'm, I'm super happy to be here. Uh, I would have thought, uh, being a guy from New Jersey who's sort of in the marketing space, as I know a number of you are, that I would have nothing in common, that what I would say to you would have nothing in common with what uh, Dr. Beecham had to say. And while I may know literally nothing about Higgs boson masses and things like that, I do know a little bit, well, very little about this universe. And I do know at least one thing, and that I will ask questions about this universe. And one of the things I was thinking about as I was listening to him, which I thought he was awesome, by the way, uh, was that I have a dog. And one of the interesting things about having a dog, and I'm sure a number of you have dogs, is that they have this amazing limited set of concerns in life. You know, they need to eat. It's very primal, right? They need to eat and they need love and attention and probably a few other things. But it seems there are very few things that they actually don't understand. They don't, they're not quizzical or, or, um, or, or, want, or they're not really in wonder that much. And when I listen to Dr. Beecham and think about you know, this universe, it, it is awesome to be a human and realize that there are so many things that you do not understand. And that's a cool thing, right? Because if you understood everything, how boring would that be? Uh, so that's, and, and so the comments I'm gonna make today uh, are not really about Accenture Interactive. They're not really about, you know, commerce technology or programmatic or digital marketing or how to build your brand or anything like that, really. They're gonna be more, a little bit more about this universe. And in the time I have, I'm not ask, going to ask you to necessarily change your thinking. I'm not going to ask you to adopt a certain point of view. But I am going to ask you to think about a couple of things. As marketers, as technologists, as agency executives, as uh, you know, CMOs and deep, deep, uh, executives in the experience space, media executives, international, regional. Think about what you can do regarding this universe. I will explain. Let's take a little look, starting with 50 years ago and then immediately jumping to today, what the world is like. <laughs> I live in that world every day. My children live in that world every day. And all of you and your children live in that world every day. You see all the modern uh, transformational references in there. I mean, it seems that we can do anything. And I remember, you know, when I was younger and pe people in the older generation then, which I'm sort of in now, I guess, uh, would talk about, you know, back when I was young, you know, we, we went to school uphill both ways and all that stuff. And, uh, but I remember there were actually real things that my children cannot relate to at all. Like after sports practice in high school, how would I get my ride home? I would put a coin in the payphone, and, or excuse me, I would not have a coin typically, and I would call collect. I would call my mom collect she would refuse the charges, hang up the phone, and then come get me, knowing that I was ready. And everyone in the entire high school did the same thing. It was a really weird thing. And that's just what we did. And I tried to explain this to my kids, and, and it was so far away from their level of understanding. You know, yes, of course, we had the texting thing and this. And these days, my soon-to-be 14-year-old doesn't even do that. 
we just kind of set a time, and then he tracks me on the phone as to when I'm going to be close. So he can, his point of reference is so far off. So it seems compared to years ago, I and mean, we put a man on the moon 50 years ago, it seems we can do anything. Yet, are we doing the right things? Are we deploying our human capital, our financial capital, at the right problems in the right way, in the right, the right constellation of investment? So about 20 years ago, um, I'll tell you a slight personal story. I live in the northeast in the US in an area that gets a ton of snow. And uh, I had bought for the holidays for my family, and uh, kind of we lived in an area with lots of kids around. We bought one of these giant, we called it a giant toboggan. I don't know if that word uh, is relevant here, but it's one of these giant wooden sleds. We know the curly thing at the front. And, uh, and here I was, uh, you know, wh never been used, waxing it up and getting it all fast. And this thing fit like five people on it. I'd never used it before. So the neighborhood kids, uh, and my kids and I, we went out to this, in, in an area I live, there's this very large hill. It's the kind of hill, like imagine yourself walking 10 full minutes up the hill. Uh, not like a ski slope, but a big hill. And as we got to the hill, we noticed there was this, at the bottom of the hill, because it snowed a lot from the previous days earlier, there was a giant snowman about this tall, uh, built. Like the boulder at the bottom was about this big, and the snowman was, you know, a couple of meters high. And so I took some of the neighborhood kids up there, never used this toboggan before. I go up to the top, and I put them on the I'm in the back with the big rope thing. And we start down the hill, and immediately in the first two seconds, I knew there was going to be a major problem. Uh, this thing just takes off like a bat out of hell. And I have these, all these young children right in front of me. And I mean, I've, the, the, the horror, horror was, was approaching my mind right away. We get halfway down this hill. I'm literally forcibly abusing these children, grabbing them by their hair and their scruff, throwing them off, reaching this one. I literally got all three off. And as, I'm not kidding, as I got the third one off, the toboggan went sideways, boom, straight into the snowman, of course, right? which was full of ice at that point. So, why am I telling you this story? Well, I've learned three things in the next hour or two after that. The first is that I'm a big freaking idiot. Okay, that was the first thing. The second thing is I was soon to learn that I had four broken ribs here. And, you know, being a relatively healthy person at the time, I'd never been through uh, various uh, elements of medical trauma. So I went through what was the, what we call the emergency room or the acute trauma scenario at that time, some 20 years ago, and this is what it looked like. So, what did I do? I broke my bones, right? And then I got a ride or drove to the hospital, and then I got in, there was a big waiting room, and I went up to the desk, and I told them what happened for the first time. I went through the whole thing, lots of paperwork and insurance information, filled out lots of paperwork. I sat down, and I did some fine reading of some magazines, and was bored out of my mind for one to two hours. Then I went back up to the desk, and I politely inquired, what's going on? And they said, please wait, effectively. So then I went back, and I listened to my Sony Walkman at the time, and then eventually, I got concerned because there's someone coughing up a lung on my right and someone with strep throat on my left, uh, worried not to get sick, and eventually got seen by the various levels of 22, 24, 26, and 28-year-old consecutive medical professionals. Each of them of which I had to tell this ridiculous, horrible snowman story, starting from the beginning each time. So, that was 20 years ago. So, in the day of us being able to do anything, now, 20 years hence, what happens? So, earlier this year, my son was playing basketball and kind of cracked his head open and slid into kind of a concrete wall on the side of the gymnasium. Had, you know, a pretty big gash in his head, everything's fine, but had to, be, had to have a similar experience. So I, it was like flashback all over again, only I was bringing him. So let's take a look at what that experience was like 20 years later. 
Oddly enough, it was exactly the same. Exactly the same, literally exactly the same, except instead of the magazine, I could use Wi-Fi in the lobby and do Twitter or Instagram or whatever. It was truly exactly the same, or listen to music. Absolutely no different at all. I found that to be fascinating. How is that possible? You know, we put a man on the moon 50 years ago. You know, you can have groceries delivered in half an hour and all these other crazy, awesome things that make our lives better. How is this even possible? I mean, why can't this happen in the gymnasium and I have, like you have with everything else, like half of you are looking at, and within the last hour, some app, and it tells me the three regional hospitals, the logistics of getting there, and the traffic, and the proper routing for each one. It also tells me the waiting time in each hospital. It tells me what physician is on call, whether or not they have an orthopedic background, or a disease background, or what have you. It uploads all of my insurance information. Uh, you know, it perhaps even uploads vital signs. And I get there, automatically routed, I get directly into a room, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the story is already printed out what happened to me because I've entered that information. Well, I mean, how, how is it even remotely possible that we don't have the technology, the process, or know-how for some version of that? Makes absolutely no sense to me. So, as marketers, as technologists, I think about these things, and I think about working and living in this universe. Well, what else is going on in the world? Let's take a look around us. We've all seen slides like this. The problem with these slides is that they're true. They're, they're true. Many, many children in the world do not have proper medical treatment. In this case, one of the instances might be vaccinations. Now, here's the problem with such a large percentage, millions of children not, not having access to vaccinations. Now, why is that? Is it because people don't, I mean, there is an anti-vaccination camp, and that's true, but that's actually not what this point's about. So why is this? Well, it's not so much about the vaccination itself, it's that to be vaccinated, Vaccines have to be constantly refrigerated. And a huge percentage of the world that needs vaccination does not have access to refrigeration. Take the country of Nigeria, 190 million people. 90 million of them, almost half, have no access to consistent refrigeration. So how do you do that? Then there's the issue of, speaking of vaccinations, then there's the issue of identity. So you get to these remote villages, let's say you, you solve the refrigeration problem, and you bring someone up, and maybe you're vaccinating for typhoid fever, fever maybe it's Ebola, or something, and you bring in these, these people that live in these remote villages, have no understanding, no familiarity with technology or medical treatment, and you say, they have no sense of identity, and they say, Do you, have you received this before? What vaccinations have you received before? I don't know. Needle, aren't, they don't know. There's no digital footprint either. So how do you keep track of that? Which intersects with this lovely problem. There's more than a billion of people in the world that struggle to get basic human and government services because they don't have any form of digital identity, which intersects with the medical issues of the world, such as what I just gave. Which, by the way, if you are at least in the southeastern United States or have watched that on uh, CNN or BBC or whatever your international network of choice is, you saw that a couple weeks ago there was a devastating Category 5 hurricane, Hurricane Dorian, over the northwestern element of the Bahamas. It's an, I'm a big fly fisherman, and this is an area I've been many times, this specific area called Abaco Island. This, there's no elevation here. It's, it's a fairly impoverished land. And this entire structure was just wiped out. The entire series of islands. Just, it's basically just rubble now. And there's 70,000 people left homeless. So the various Bahamian and US and other governments are trying to help. And guess what one of the biggest problems is? Digital identity. 
because they can't, they've lost everything, and as a result, processing them, aside from your view about government policies and immigration, it is a major challenge, no matter what your view is on that, because it's hard to figure out who is who. How is this even remotely possible again? Now, why is this? I don't understand it. And Accenture Interactive works on some of the most compelling, coolest customer, employee, patient experiences. We work with a number of the clients in this room, global clients. I have a lucky, lucky job. I have a great team, and we do some amazing stuff. But we are at the top of the list. We are not doing enough. So 13 years ago, I adopted a boy from Ethiopia. His name, given name was Hanuk. I call him Henry. Uh, he's from, um, I am the proud parent of the planet Earth's first chubby East African, by the way. So it is, he, he's been the light of my life for the last 13 years. And, uh, but to keep him in touch with that part of the world, I'm a you know, white guy from New Jersey, so it's not something that ne necessarily I know. So as he wants to learn more about his heritage, I happen to have a close friend who's from that part of the world. His name is Anthony. And I get together with Henry and Anthony with some regularity, and we talk about that part of the world. And, and, and Henry, my son, knows a little bit about work, and he kind of sees things through the appropriate, beautiful, and simple uh, lens. And so, but we talk about that part of the world, and we talk about things like medical treatment. We talk about things like food. And what Anthony says is that, you know what people really need? They need water. And Henry says, well, can't we give them more water? And Anthony explains that, well, we, what we really need is water technology. And the first thing Henry says is, see, Dad, you tell me to get off technology all the time, and here your friend is telling me that all of Africa needs technology. So I had a hard time answering that one. But what Anthony was explaining is that these communities, they're not looking to change the way they live. They're looking to just feed themselves. So there is plenty of water, but the water is under the ground. And so what we need is the $16,000, 15, 15 to $20,000 to create the pump that draws the water out of the ground to irrigate the area of land just for that particular community so it can be self-sustaining. They don't need water donations. They need water technology. So again, that water technology has been there for years. So in a world where we can solve anything, why aren't we doing that? So when I ask this question, I talk about this with folks in your types of roles, I generally get three types of answers. The first is perhaps we lack the technology, as I said, which I want to challenge. So let's just take a look. So this woman you're about to see in a second, who's going to be very happy because she received diapers for her newborn child in one hour delivered to her door. Look at this beautiful young woman. She's very happy, right? As she should be. I do the same thing. I order stuff all the time like that. Let's think about the logistics, the supply chains of our world right now. They are amazing. It is truly amazing what we can do. All right, three years ago, Puerto Rico, another massive storm, almost 10,000 shipping containers of aid made it to the port of San Juan to help the people of Puerto Rico. Half of those were food. Half of the half of those containers rotted in the port because we did not have the logistics for that last mile, per se, and did not think that through. Now, how is that possible that we can get those diapers in one hour, but we can't get food to people who need it when we have it there from all over the world? from donations and efforts and the investment in human and financial capital from good people like us, right? We're helping. How is that possible? Doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand. Do you understand? I don't. So,
I don't think it's that we don't have the technology. I think is that we're not really applying that with purpose. So what are the other questions? The next question is that, well, financial markets, fear of recession, essentially capital issues. Well, venture capital raised has gone up 60% in the last two years. There's been an incremental $120 billion above what was raised two years ago added to the VC raise globally. That's a pretty healthy financial market, particularly in the areas of digital health, money, which we're, we're, we're much of which we're discussing here. $7 billion increase in the last two years. And this last point, pretty interesting. There is a vast transfer of wealth going on from the baby boomer generation, who essentially globally has all the money, to the millennial generation. The difference is the millennial generation, who are largely the consumers and the future consumers of the clients and businesses we help care about and run, truly care about sustainability and purpose. So there's a massive wealth transfer going on, and the people that are going to have the future wealth of the world care. So the money is there. So the third angle is, is this purposeful innovation good for business or not? Well, I can tell you this. We have studied this exact point, and employee retention goes up 300% when employees can associate a particular purpose with their employer. In addition, half of consumers find brands uh, more attractive when they can identify a particular purpose with it. It goes on and on. Business, the business results of companies 10x in that 15-year period of companies that have been identified as purpose-oriented. So, we have business results, it is good business. And we have innovation being good for business. But much of the innovation we've had has not had a clear purpose. And I think we're all guilty of that a little bit. So again, I come back to the question of why. And rather than tell you why that is, I can tell you what some of the factors that we see in the executive uh, and management landscape of the world. And it really comes down to this, ye old human brain. And what I'm asking you to do is think about this. Because the first thing that we see is executives being afraid of breaking the permission barrier. There's this concept of sort of like consensus management that I need to have total alignment with anyone before I can proceed with any sort of breakthrough initiative. And this is a struggle for us as Accenture Interactive with our clients. This is a struggle for many others in the kind of experience agency or technical landscape as we partner with large clients. And it is a, it is a struggle for change agents within, the client, within our client base. The second thing relating to that is uncertainty and this general sense of risk of aversion. And relating to that, the third related element would be self-preservation. It is easier to not change and to not agitate and not push. But as Dr. Beecham said, we only have one universe. And each of us is only here for a little time. A little time. So I am calling out Accenture Interactive for this year to help make a difference and to help contribute. So it doesn't matter whether your client is a telecom client or a consumer goods client or in the medical field. We don't have to reinvent that business, but we should establish a business purpose that relates to helping people, helping actual humans. Now, the good news is we're making some progress. I mean, if you check out some of these things that we're doing, this first one is a uh, social welfare example where if you've ever had been in a horrible situation, you work with a child and family services program where they may have to look at pulling a child out of a troubled home, it's a very difficult environment for a government employee to walk into. It's often, uh, in some cases, violent and unsafe. So how do you train for that? So with AR, VR, and real 
acting, we have a highly produced solution for this that can simulate decision making in terms of what you would do when you get into this very difficult type of real human problem. You know, in Stockholm, we have Stockholm Exergy, the memory lane problem solution, which is about really curing loneliness, using Google Home and artificial intelligence to narrate a story, perhaps about one's lost love years ago, and Google and the solution will prompt them and tell a story and actually produce a book about that story that they can then uh, pass on to their future generations. Number one problem, the older generation in Stockholm, loneliness. Babylon Health in the UK. Why can't we see a doctor over the phone? Why can't we uh, have access to basic medical needs uh, like this? We can now. These are all good things. These are all really good things. So how do we start making this difference? Well, it has to come from the top. There's no other way around it. The board, CEO, leaders like you guys have to establish, and I'm calling me out, I'm calling out my team, I'm calling out the broader industry. You have to lead with clarity and find some element. It's going to be good business. Remember that wealth transfer? about $70 trillion transferring to the millennials over the next 15 years. They're gonna be in charge and they care, so get ready. So even if you don't buy the whole human first initiative I'm trying to talk about, think about it through a business lens. So find some element of a purpose. And most of all, when you go into the grocery store, typically grocery stores measure on two things. How many times do you come and what's your basket size? Well. The grocery store of the future will also be measured on the ability to get in and out and buy some children's Advil when your child has a fever, fever to get in and out quickly, because that is the purpose that they're seeking at that time. That's what they need. So I ask you to just think about these things, and I'll leave you with one more thought. What is this? So every January, there's the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, and it is a crazy series of crazy craziness. And uh, in, in a way, I go out there last couple years with a small camera crew, and I learn. It's a research project for me and my team. And it's fascinating. And if you think about this is where the kind of the world is investing capital to solve problems, to sell goods, I mean, the people buying these things are not dogs, they're all humans, right? So these are what the world has decided to invest in. And I go out there and we have all these real world problems. Um, and make no mistake, I work for a for-profit company, public company, and I have to hit my bottom line just like most of you. So I go out to the Consumer Electronics Show and I study what's going out there. And this year I counted one, two, goes up to eight. Eight different investments on how to better process cat litter, okay? Eight different decisions, business decisions where people said, I know, I'm gonna deploy a few million bucks to reinventing how we manage cat litter. Not just one, eight of them, and that's just at the CES show. And I asked myself the question, is that right? I mean, maybe we can just do with one? So I just want to leave you with a thought on this, and that as executors in charge of marketing budgets, sales budgets, technology budgets, you are in charge of innovation. But you're also assuming a responsibility for purpose as well. And can you elevate your purpose equal to the innovation? because it's that intersection of purpose and innovation that is gonna be good for this universe and good for your bottom line. Thank you for having me.